is as being drawn for tonight. The two grand prizes are that rifle as well as a beautiful handmade squash blossom necklace and earrings made by Doc Jones. And we hope everybody gets a chance on that. Uh, and we'll, we appreciate the support that helps all this programming. Again, the Guardians uh, support the operation of this museum as well as the programming and the promotion of it. So you guys make it all possible. So um, this is when I really miss Deb because uh, she does a, such a great job of introducing our special speakers. But I would like to introduce Mr. Frank Norris. He was with the uh, National Park Service in the trails office of the, in there in Santa Fe. And he became quite well versed in all things Santa Fe Trail. Uh, he still lives in Santa Fe and he's journeyed with us uh, to come be with us today in Wallace. Frank, we really welcome you and we look forward to what you have to share. Thank you very much. Um, I... Sure. Um, I retired from the National Park Service, so oh, two years ago, I guess. And, uh, but uh, had a chance to get to know the Santa Fe Trail really pretty well. One of the main questions that I found myself asking after, you know, I, I served as a, as a historian in the trails office in which we would work with partners uh, and with the Santa Fe Trail Association on various kinds of projects. And it was my job to kind of bone up on the history and to be able to, to be kind of a resource for answering all kinds of miscellaneous questions that would pop up. And one thing I found myself asking pretty early in the game is where did the Santa Fe Trail go? Now the, 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 there is a management plan that we put together that really traces really pretty exactly where on the ground the, the two routes, the, both the, the mountain route and the Cimarron route went. But that doesn't really answer the question in terms of how people got from one end of the, one end of the trail to the other over the 59 year history of the trail. And the more I looked into it, the more I thought uh, the standard histories kind of touch on it, but an awful lot of this, they just kind of glide over. And I have a hunch that a number of you being situated where you are know more information the, than the average trail person. But, so, so maybe I'm talking to the wrong audience, but hear me out and we'll have a chance to all learn a little bit over the next few minutes. So, so when I talk about the changing geography of the Santa Fe Trail, believe me, the, the trail's always been where it's been, but where people did, went at different times, it's a far more dynamic trail than anyone thought, because I think if you, you ask an awful lot of people where the trail went, they'll say, started at the Missouri River and ended up in Santa Fe. Well, one thing we found out, it is a two-way trail. Just as many people went eastbound as westbound, and it was not an immigrant's route, it was a commercial route, as, as, as Mike mentioned. But where people started and how people got there put up with me for the next few minutes and you'll have a chance to see that there's some interesting twists and turns. Okay, most of you probably know how things started out. William Becknell, September 1st of 1821, he lived near Franklin, Missouri, which at that time was kind of the, the edge of the settled Ang, you know, Anglo-American uh, uh, frontier at that time, and he was broke. He was living on borrowed money, but he was a trader. So he got five of his friends, and even though he knew that several people before him had headed for Santa Fe, and what they got in reward for their efforts was uh, imprisonment and a trip to a Durango or Chihuahua jail, basically. Um, he decided to try anyway. 
he got lucky because he had no way of knowing this, nor did anybody else. But as he and his five men, along with you know, mule packs full of trade goods, what happened as he was walking along is the revolution was completed in Mexico. And when he left Missouri, he, uh, Santa Fe was a part of a Spanish province. And by the time he got to Santa Fe, it was, it was part of Mexico. And Mexico um, wanted to trade with the U.S., whereas Spain had said, don't you dare trade with us. We want to keep everything Spanish, you know, enclosed within our system. So, so that's why we have a Santa Fe Trail. And so he made a lot of money off of that thing. He, he, he was in Santa Fe for about three weeks. He... he got lots of gold coins at very high prices for his goods, came on back, um, and and the way he, he and his five men, we don't know who the five men that he went with were, uh, and we think that the way he got to Santa Fe was somewhere along where that purple line is, but we're not sure. He might have crossed over Raton Pass. He might have gone over Manco Burro Pass. He might have gone over Emer through Emory Gap. We don't know. And maybe some of you have some good theories on someplace else that he went. But once he got there, speaking to some of the local citizenry, he said, you can get back to, um, back to Missouri without having to go up and over those mountains. And so on the way back, once again, we don't know the exact route, but we think he went on a route that was pretty close to what became known as the Cimarron route. And you'll see that in several of the next few slides. So, so he, he did kind of a triangular back and forth, if you want to call it that. Naturally, by the time he gets back to Franklin, shows all these you know, silver coins, uh, everybody else starts getting interested. He comes back the next year, and it opens up a very successful trade between these two countries over the next 20, 25 years. So during the early to mid-1820s, uh, this is the standard way in which people got between, from one end of the trail to the other. Uh, once again, most people started in Santa Fe, but in, um, but in uh, March of 1827, the town of Independence is, is founded. And in addition to that, you've got uh, Lexington. A number of people begin their trip from there. Fort Osage is starting to decline as a trading fort, so not really that important, but some people that probably get supplied there. It's now kind of in the eastern end of the Kansas City suburbs. And once again, to avoid the mountains, and because they know where the various water holes are along the way, they follow the Cimarron route. That original route that Becknell took over the mountain route, in order to get from one end of the trail to the other, 934 miles. But by taking the Cimarron route, it's only 890 miles. And I throw these numbers out because over the next few minutes, you're going to hear the story of the magically disappearing trail. It just keeps getting shorter and shorter as time goes on. So, like I said, by, by uh, 1828, the um, independence has been founded, uh, but it's not really much of a trading center for several years. So, starting it, just for this short transition period, in 1829 and 1890, once again, you have kind of a, a mix of places that people are starting. Franklin, it's pretty much seen its better days. Franklin was right on the Missouri River. It's, uh, uh, and it's down in the bottom land. So in 1826, Franklin gets socked by a major flood. Two years later, an even larger flood comes along, and there's virtually nothing left of the town anymore. So the residents there pack up and move to what's now called New Franklin. And so it's up on the bluff, and 
it's a far more substantial town. You can still visit it today. But Franklin itself is now, you know, farmland. And, and you know, there, there was nothing left of it. The, the population uh, scattered away. They figured twice in, in three years was too much. So things begin moving upriver. Also, the frontier line keeps moving upriver a little bit. Steamboats are able to head a little farther upriver, and they start serving this new town of Independence. So, so during the 1829 and 1830 period, you've got Fayette as well as Lexington and Independence that people are leaving from. They're still going over the Cimarron route. The, the length of the trail is now 837 miles, assuming that um, uh, you start in Lexington. So once again, by, by now you've lost almost 100 miles of the Santa Fe Trail. Let's move on to 1831. And 1831 I, I choose because a number of you may, may be familiar with the, the, um, the commerce of the prairie, Josiah Gregg's epic story of the, of the trail. He went over the trail a number of times, kind of a bookish sort of fella who wrote kind of a masterful volume, first person point of view about what the Santa Fe Trail was like. And, and he talks about independence from kind of the ground up. And so by 1831, you have a pattern that sticks around for, you know, well over a decade in which Independence is really kind of the, the reigning queen of the Santa Fe Trail. So if you're looking for kind of that great stereotype period of, of going from the, Santa Fe, from the Missouri River to the Santa Fe, the 1831 to 1845 period is a good time because, because you know, Francis Parkman writes about this, this same era in terms of all the hustle and bustle around the Independence Square. So by this time, with Independence being the, uh, the, the kind of eastern anchor of the trail, the trail's 800 miles long. All, in 1846, the United States goes to war with Mexico, and two big things happen. There you go. This is just a two-year period uh, the war itself does not end until the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo has been signed in February of 1848. Effectively, however, as far as the southwestern United States is concerned, the war is all over in the summer of 1846 because uh, Cap uh, Kearney comes through with his uh, Army of the West and uh, is able to take... Uh, New Mexico, meaning Las Vegas and Santa Fe, without firing a shot. This is both in August of 1846, and then he continues on to, to California where he mixes it up and doesn't do quite so well, but he does, combined with some naval forces, California went, also becomes an American province, um, you know, within a few months later on. Two major impacts of of what's taken place in 1846 is first because of Indian raids along the, the Cimarron route, people are once again hus hustling up and over Raton Pass. It's always been there, but let's face it, you know, if you can take a flat short route rather than up and over on the, on the mountain route. Mountain route's got water, a good continuous amount from, and because I'm in Kansas, I guess I'll call it the Arkansas River. Um, but, uh, but you can also see that uh, from the map, you're no longer going you know, on an international trip anymore. Uh, you're in kind of a no man's land because of uh, General Kearney. You're, you're staying within US control, although nominally it's still part of Mexico prior to the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe. Guadalupe, Hidalgo, excuse me. Moving on to 1848 to 1860, once again, we have kind of a nice period of stability in which uh, they're, they're starting out along the Missouri River and they're using the Cimarron route. Uh, but 
a major difference is that big things have been going on in the Kansas City area. And what had started out as a very small um, port, uh, place called uh, Westport, and then a landing three or four miles north of that along the Missouri River, they have grown considerably. People realize that they can save some uh, wagon trip length by, uh, by sailing to Westport Landing, outfitting in Westport, and, and heading west on the trail from there. And so independence is starting, is slowly starting to get eclipsed as the main eastern trail junction, not only for the Santa Fe Trail, but also for the o Oregon Trail, and also after 1848, the California Trail really starts rising up as important as well. So all three of those gather together and make Westport and Westport Landing uh, more viable than uh, independence. Although independence continues to receive uh, westbound trail visitors all the way into the mid to late 1850s. By this time in the 1848 to 1860 period, we have a trail length of 788 miles. Then the war hits. So what you have here is because of the tensions surrounding the Civil War, nobody heads west from the present day Kansas City area anymore. Instead, they all head north out of Leavenworth. You, the, the period of bleeding Kansas, which it was admittedly brief uh, in the you know, mid to late 1850s, kind of scares people away from going through uh, eastern Kansas in order to get to Council Grove and such, they kind of drop down from the north side. So for a relatively brief period, both in the late 1850s and uh, sporadically through the early 1860s, people are dropping down. And also because uh, of Indian depredations along the, civil, uh, the Cimarron route, and this is because all the military troops, not all of them, but most of them have been you know, headed east. There's a major war going on. So they, uh, once again, for safety purposes, they're traveling up the uh, Arkansas River and up and over Raton Pass. So the, the trail gets a little bit longer during the Civil War. It's 834 miles instead of 788. So uh, there's a relatively brief period right after the war where things go back to what they had been before. But then comes a period that, that you in this audience may become more familiar with. What, take, had, what had also taken place during the Civil War is that two railroads began construction. Cyrus Holliday's, Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe, and, and the Kansas Pacific. And, and neither of those really impact on the Santa Fe Trail until June of 1866, because the Kansas Pacific, which started out as the Union Pacific Eastern Division, and it was not a subset of the Union Pacific, it was actually a rival to the Union Pacific, it starts in Wyandotte, heads uh, west along the river, and by the time it gets to Junction City, they are advertising that they are gonna carry freight as well as passenger traffic, and so if if you can go all the way to Junction City on the railroad, why would you take the, the, uh, your, your wagon all the way from the Kansas City area? So what's taking place is that people are doing just that and they head out to Junction City and because Junction City is well north of this usual route of Santa Fe, Council Grove, which has been like the mainstay of the Santa Fe Trail through all these years where, where people had outfitted their wagons and they got the hardwood for the axles and this sort of thing like that. Council Grove is, gets virtually no more Santa Fe Trail traffic. And instead, everybody is heading west from Junction City along the, the route of the Butter, Butterfield Overland Dispatch. And then once you get to Fort Harker, you kind of drop down on a di diagonal over to Fort Zara, right around today's Great Bend, 
and then head west along the usual route of the, uh, of the Santa Fe Trail, once again using the Cimarron route to, to make the more direct route down towards Santa Fe. And the next few slides simply show that as the Union Pacific Eastern Division, which soon becomes the Kansas Pacific, that as it lengthens out, the Santa Fe Trail gets a little bit shorter as it goes along. So by June of 1867, the railroad has been extended out to the Ellsworth area, Fort Harker, and once again from there, they use that relatively short diagonal trail from Ellsworth down to Great Bend and follow the usual route of the Santa Fe Trail uh, on, on across the Cimarron route. By this time, the, let's see, we are at, uh, the trail is uh, just 623 miles long, which is 300 miles shorter than it was from uh, uh, Franklin and about 200 miles shorter than it had been from uh, Independence. So uh, this is just a four-month period in here. Starting in 1867, the rails, you know, building west across Kansas, they make it to Fort Hayes, and, and from there, it just means that much more railroad, that much less Santa Fe Trail. Um, once again, most of the Santa Fe Trail in central Kansas has now been relegated to local uses, and people are, are starting their, their trips on here. What, what Mike was talking about in our, our last, uh, in the last presentation is holding true in that each of these towns, both Junction City, uh, Ellsworth, and, uh, and now Hayes City, they're all hell on wheels towns in which you've got the uh, Otero and Seller Company and other commission merchants who have their warehouses along the tracks and, and things are moving, you know, it's, it's kind of like the Union Pacific as, the, as they build the Transcontinental Railroad. You have various, uh, I think primarily Irish gangs that are helping to, to build these railroads and uh, life is lived along in tents and railroad cars and that sort of thing. So uh, between, uh, for about an eight month period there, Fort Hayes is the end of the line and the, the trail is now just 568 miles long. So here we are in, in your neck of the woods in that between June of 1868 and March of 1870, Sheridan is the end of the line. Uh, it was a, a short town, 2,000 people in it. Uh, life was not very um, dear at that time. Uh, there are first-person accounts of staying in hotels, of bullets whizzing through the floor, and that sort of thing like that. Um, but, uh, but, but by this time, if you went to the end of the tracks, you got on the Butterfield Overland Dispatch, headed through uh, past the Pond Creek Station, and continued on down to, to uh, Fort Lyon, where you met the the um, main route of the Santa Fe Trail. By this time, you are taking the um, mountain route of the Santa Fe Trail. The Cimarron route has been completely abandoned because you've gone so far west that it, it's no longer logistically makes any sense. So at, at this time, uh, the trail is, uh, Santa Fe Trail is only 428 miles long. And, okay, by 1870, however, the rails have been extended out to Kit Carson, Colorado. Everything that had been in Sheridan gets picked up and moved. I think Mike told you about sawing all the commission buildings in, in you know, in lengths and loading them onto flat cars. And virtually overnight, Sheridan is ghosted and things move on to, to Kit Carson. And they stay in Kit Carson. By this time, 
Um, the trail is just 358 miles long between Kit Carson and Santa Fe. Um, they, they drop down from Kit Carson down to Bent's Old Fort, although Bent's Old Fort was abandoned years earlier, but it's the route that headed down there, and then it continues on. Now, something very important happens during this three-year period, and that an upstart new railroad comes onto the scene in addition to not only the, the Kansas Pacific and the Santa Fe Railroad, which has been building throughout this period, but it just hasn't been in direct competition with the Kansas Pacific. A new railroad comes online, the Denver and Rio Grande. It starts as a short line simply between Denver and Colorado Springs, but both of those railroads are gonna start getting into the picture and creating a really interesting competitive atmosphere. So by, by July of 1873, and I don't know if you ever saw the Ronald Reagan movie of, of uh, Santa Fe in which they had a deadline that by the end of 1872, the Santa Fe absolutely had to get to the western end of Kansas or lose its possibility for a government subsidy. Well, uh, it's a good movie. Just treat it as a movie. Um, but but they in fact are able to get to uh, the west end of Kansas, you know, the, the Cyrus K. Holiday and, and his followers, and by July of 1873, they extend that line. By the way, sometimes these things are, go kind of slowly because like in 1873, a financial panic hits the United States. And so nobody has any money, and the existing railroads sometimes go into receiverships. So, so if, if some of these seem like we have lots of activity and then very little activity, well, there are larger forces that take place that kind of, you know, kind of tie the hands of the major financiers. But by, 18, by the summer of 1873, there are two viable ways to get to Santa Fe. You can, you can go to Kit Carson like you always did, but you could also take the Santa Fe to Granada and then take what had been a military road called the uh, Granada Fort Union Wagon Road um, for 100 miles or so, somewhere down to where they meet down there, kind of at the southwest end of the map is Fort Union. Fort Union was a was a huge place for 30, 35 years because Fort Union, if you were part of the army and before the railroads came, it was where everything that went anywhere in New Mexico or Arizona was distributed from. It was kind of like the, the key resource there. But, um, but that was the southwestern end of the Granada Fort Union wagon road. And so... Um, you, you could take either one of those routes for, admittedly, a four-month period. Things move fast sometimes. Uh, that fall and for the next two years, um, Santa Fe had been at a relative standstill once it got there, probably because of this financial panic that I mentioned. But, um, but in order to keep competitive, the Kansas Pacific dropped down from Kit Carson and built a spur line uh, down to Las Animas, spur line, um, which uh, kept them in, in plenty of advantage for some time. And uh, once again, two different competitive ways in which people could travel the Santa Fe Trail. And once again, Kit Carson um, and uh, Las Animas had the commission houses that uh, Mike Olson was talking about. Now for just a four month period in here, what we have is uh, Santa Fe decided to play catch up and, and so they extended their line from Granada over to Las Animas and regardless of which route you took, it was still, let's see, I'm trying to, uh, it was just 304 miles from Las Animas 
to uh, Santa Fe going either way on uh, this air on taking either railroad from the Missouri River area to Los Animas. In, uh, in December of 1875, uh, the Kansas Pacific makes a rather daring maneuver and decides to extend its rails for another 20, 25 miles. And, and uh, they extend their railroad tracks to La Junta. And what happens three days later? The Santa Fe does the exact same thing. They are not going to get outcompeted in this business. And so, once again, they are, they are in, in the same kind of position, except instead of uh, it being, let's see, 304 miles, it is now just 285 miles to get from end of track to um, Santa Fe. And all of the excitement that had been prevailing in previous months at Kit Carson or Los Animas, all that's gone now, and and for at least uh, four months, La Junta is the center of activity for anyone taking the Santa Fe Trail, and and that's the great transition point. Uh, Mike referred to this really briefly, but um, but over the next uh, during this same period. Uh, the the um, Denver and Rio Grande is continuing continuing to build south, and things start getting even more interesting in terms of the rivalry between um, these other railroads and the Denver and Rio Grande. What takes place in between April of seventy six and September of eighteen seventy eight is. Um, no further trackage has been built by, um, by the Kansas Pacific. For whatever reason, because of, of um, well, what takes place is Jay Gould, the financier, has taken over the Kansas Pacific. It has been essentially subsumed by the Union Pacific. And Jay Gould realizes that he's, he has other fish to fry. And to a certain extent, while they continue to attract people as far as, as uh, La Junta, they don't go any farther than that. So Kansas Pacific starts to kind of phase out as a competitor. But at that very same time, the Denver and Rio Grande forges its way, because as you can see, um, the, the Denver and Rio Grande which started out in Denver, dropped down to Colorado Springs. It has continued down to Pueblo, but it builds a line south to El Moro, where, as Mike said, that there were these coal mines there. And, and they had their sights set on going up and over Raton Pass. As you can see, um, Santa Fe, well, no, you... You, you can't tell it from the map, but the, the people that are running the Santa Fe also want to do the same thing. And um, maybe I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but by the time September of 1878 takes place, Santa Fe has built a railroad down to uh, Trinidad. And of course, it's still there, the route between La Junta and Trinidad. And so by September of, of 1878, the two rival railroads, the Denver and Rio Grande and the Atchison Pacific and Atchison Topeka and Santa Fe, they both have uh, rails built to the north end of Raton Pass. But what has taken place in February of 1878 is there is this what I think is an epic confrontation that takes place. Mike went over it very briefly, but, but um, track men or surveyors for both of these railroads rode the same train down to El Moro. And as, as Mike stole my thunder on this one, the, the, the DNRG folks went out to dinner and the Santa Fe folks uh, did an all-nighter basically headed up the, the, uh, 
Raton Pass, made a deal with Dick Wooten, and sur made survey stakes all the way up and down the tracks so that by 4.35 in the morning, when the DNRG folks were starting to head up into Raton Pass, the people from the Santa Fe were coming back down the hill and said, uh, we just staked Raton Pass a few hours before you. So because of that, DNRG, which also had its sights set on, a, on another major goal going through the Royal Gorge, they headed in that direction, but the, the Santa Fe was able to build up and over Raton Pass and gain its footing in the southwest. So a few hours one way or the other tells the story about who got to New Mexico first. So as a result of that, you can see that uh, through late 1878 and into early 1879, um, the Santa Fe, which has built its route into Trinidad, it's feverishly building up and over uh, Raton Pass throughout this period. Actually, in November of 1878, I think November 30th, might be December 3rd, something like that, they actually get their first rails uh, through this uh, up and over Raton Pass. They didn't build a tunnel to begin with uh, and are able to claim trackage within New Mexico. And as Mike said, by February of 1879, They've gone all the way up and over uh, Raton Pass and headed down to Otero, which is just a little bit south of, of Raton. And, uh, and they've, um, they've completed their entrance you know, with being able to build traffic right into the state of, or territory of New Mexico. And for the next year or so. I've got two or three more slides here, but to a large extent, it's, it's mainly just one company, the Santa Fe Railroad, running out its length. By February of 1879, the Santa Fe Trail is 202 miles long. Uh, if you've been over the, that route between uh, Raton and Las Vegas, it's, you know, grassy, high plains country. It wasn't too difficult to build across. So within four months, they're able to complete the trackage all the way down to Las Vegas. They reach Las Vegas around July 1st. And in fact, the, the locomotive is featured in the July 4th parade in 1879. So it, it's essentially all over but the shouting by this time. Um, the Santa Fe Trail is now 64 miles long. Uh, and sure enough, between Las Vegas and Santa Fe, it's just a matter of building uh, tracks um, up to Glorietta Pass and dropping down the other side. In the meantime, the Santa Fe folks have told the city officials in Santa Fe they're essentially, you know, the Santa Fe people have said, well, you know, we're the capital of the province of New Mexico. You know, we are the big cheese around here. All traffic comes through this place. The Santa Fe Trail has, has ended here for 59 years, and it was the end of the El Camino Real de Tierra Adentro for 250 years before that. Well, the Santa Fe people said, we don't care because Santa Fe... In, in terms of the topography for building a railroad is out of our way and it's you're kind of useless to us basically because their purpose as the Santa Fe Railroad was to build toward the Rio Grande and Santa Fe was 18 miles off of that main route that they projected as the, the easiest route to survey a railroad. So they, they, they made a deal with the, the city of uh, Santa Fe that said, if you don't want to be left out of the game completely, you'd better hold a bond election and give us the money so that we'll at least put a spur track over to your town. And they said, well, under those conditions, I think we'll do that. And so sure enough, in October of 1879, they, they do build it 
And on February 9th of 1890, that spur track opens up to traffic and the Santa Fe Trail is done. By, by that time, you can take a railroad in probably uh, a day and a half at that time. Trains didn't go terribly quickly in those days. And, uh, and the Santa Fe Trail essentially was no more. So that's the, the history of the Santa Fe Trail in a nutshell. Here's a little chart, which I hope the numbers don't completely confuse you. But what this shows is that in terms of main trackage mile distance, if you go over here, you can see that the numbers are all, not, not always, because, because of a war, you might have to shift from the Cimarron route to the mountain route or something like that. But in general, as time goes on, the Santa Fe Trail keeps getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And, and of course, you've got this interlude where sometimes you need to, to travel along a stage line or some other auxiliary line before you get to the main route of the Santa Fe Trail. So, so this is a very long-winded way of saying the Santa Fe Trail, during its 59 years, always you know, was hardly ever the same route, particularly after they started building railroads. So, you know, you have to qualify it and put a couple of asterisks in which you say, where did the Santa Fe Trail go? Uh, this is the end of my talk. Do you have any questions you, you would like to ask? Well, I guess I've snowed you completely. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Um, have you ever heard that people prefer like the, the Pacific Railroad over the Santa Fe Railroad? You know, like the people taking the train. And, have you ever heard history of? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, comfort was not really the highest priority on those early trains. You almost get the feeling, um, you, you, you may have seen like old woodcuts of people taking immigrant trains uh, on you know, the Union Pacific and on, on to San Francisco and this kind of thing, where um, you know, the, the food was terrible um, and th they were not very comfortable. Pullman cars had not been perfected by that time. So even if you were wealthy, you might be able to bring along a private car but certainly nothing, you know, the Harvey House experience, which, you know, so much revolutionized railroads, started out as improving things within stations, and only much later did they move into having dining cars on railroads. So, th thank goodness the Harvey Company, which, which was part of the Santa Fe system, by the way, it wasn't, it wasn't subsumed in the system, but it was a partnership between Fred Harvey and and the Santa Fe, you know, they at least ensured that as everybody ran off the, the trains, that, they, that there was good, healthy food ready for them. And there had been some pretty dreadful excuses for meals before Fred Harvey came along. And I suspect that that was the rule on American railroads in most places before Fred Harvey was kind of the tail that wagged the dog and improved things for a lot of American railroads. If somebody else has a comment along that line that you know can assist that, um, that would be helpful. You had a question? Uh, you, okay. Any other question? Okay. Yes. Uh, it was. Um, I think it was at uh, Wagon Box Springs, which is you know in in western Kansas. Yeah, just south of Ulysses a few miles. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that would have been right along the Cimarron route. And that was one of the most dependable and most needed water holes in an otherwise pretty dry part of the, the, the trail. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Sure. 
this not cool how, I mean, here's the 200th anniversary of the Santa Fe Trail, and many of us had no really good connection of how where we were was connecting to the Santa Fe Trail, and it's a very extensive connect, connection. Absolutely. I would like to recognize uh, Deb Goodrich for putting together these wonderful lectures to more fully explain that connection. So, um, yes, Frank, on behalf of the Fort Wallace Memorial Association, thank you for that wonderful lecture. So, thank you. Yes, very, very good. And now I'd like to present D.K. Clark. So, I didn't say this uh, with, with Mike, but Frank, uh, this Dennis K. Clark lecture series is to inform, to inspire, and to preserve this heritage. And that is the selection criteria. We have a board for, uh, for this lecture series. Okay. And so these are two outstanding presentations and thank you for helping to inspire, inform, and preserve this history. Thank right. you. I appreciate your kind words. And those are on the form. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. So before I forget, um, um, Deb, uh, Peggy Fisher, uh, our wonderful local photographer who has just been taking, if you look out on our brag board, I call it our brag, black, brag board above the kitchenette area, has many of Peggy's photographs that she's been taking of our events. And she, she uh, brings the artistic view on everything. She would like to get a photo of those who were involved with the uh, library dedication. H have the canes left yet? Ah, shoot. Um, but if we can gather uh, everyone who was involved with the ceremony and clearing the canes, and I would also like to have uh, donors and volunteers to get in on that photograph. So after DK's lecture, um, we will gather in there and, and get that photograph taken. Peggy said she could do that. Any other questions or comments? If not, let's take another 10-minute break, and then we will enjoy D.K. Clark's lecture. 